right. So welcome. Welcome to the Global Homeschooling Conference. My name is Dr. Gina Riley. I'm at CUNY Hunter College uh, in New York, and I am interviewing the wonderful Dr. Rebecca English from Australia. So welcome. Thank you, Gina. I would like to start with a traditional Australian greeting called the Welcome to Country. And it's something that our Indigenous folk did before white people came here. And whenever you came to someone else's place, you would acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, past, present, and you would talk about the elders who are emerging and you would thank them for the opportunity to enjoy being on the land. And I would like to say that I am sitting on Turrbal and Yuggera land right now, which is a very amazing place to live. Lovely part of the world. That's so cool. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. So I always ask people to like introduce themselves. I don't want to introduce yourself for you. So you go ahead and you introduce yourself. Um, I am Dr. Rebecca English. Um, I am a researcher at the Queensland University of Technology. I also teach there. I am a mother of three and my research and personal interest is in home education. So can you talk a little bit more about how you got involved in home education research? Sure. So home education was something that was not really on the radar here sort of 10 years ago. But then as I was, uh, I found out I was having a baby and I was told I wasn't going to have any children. I was told I had um, the quote shriveled up ovaries of a 43 year old, which is my current age now. So I guess that means that my ovaries are shriveled. Oh, well. Um, and the doctor, I can't remember if she said the train had left the station or the boat had left the harbor. It doesn't really matter. The effect was the same. She said I was never having children. So I found myself accidentally pregnant and we were super excited because what a blessing after we've been told we weren't going to have any children. And I knew I wanted to do something really different from my own parents. My parents are very authoritarian, which is fine. That's who they are. Um, and I think they sent us to very expensive, very elite schools so that we would get the right kind of education. They were very aspirational because they weren't really elite people themselves. Um, and is quite typical in Australia. They have money, but no real cultural capital. Mm -hmm. So they sent us to a school where we would learn lots of cultural capital, my brother and I, and I did not want that for my own children. So I was doing research into attachment parenting and I happened upon home ed. And at 34 years of age, I was shocked to learn that people did that in this country. And the numbers have just massively increased in that time. Amazing. So what does homeschooling look like in Australia in 2020? Um, oh, Jeannie, you know what does homeschooling look like in the US <laughs> in 2020? You've met a homeschooling family. Congratulations. You've met one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think home education is like in the US. It's quite different here in Australia. It's, you know, state by state, just like it is in the USA. So each state or territory in Australia has different rules and regulations about how we home educate. Um, most of them call it home education, not homeschooling, because they don't like to conflate that sort of similarity, there's no similarity between the two. So I live in Queensland, which is the second biggest state by geography, but the third biggest state by population. And we have quite a large home educating population where I live. So there's roughly 3,434 children being home educated in Queensland out of a total Queensland population of probably about 5 million. So it doesn't sound big, but it is quite big because that's the entire state. Um, and of those they're, they're the ones that legally do it. So they register with the department like you're supposed to do. Um, but I, on top of that, I would estimate there's roughly 19,000 people who aren't fully registered. So back in 2012, they estimated 12,000. If you do the maths on how it's tracked up since 2012, the legal population, it would be about 19,000. The total country has about 20,000 kids who are home educated legally. So is there a spectrum? Because in the United States, so we have a spectrum, right? People who do more relaxed homeschooling, people who do more sort of like unschooling and radical unschooling. Do you see that same thing in Australia? Absolutely. So in some states and territories, because of the requirements around registration, it's quite difficult to be a radical unschooler. So if you're a radical unschooler, or probably if you're a hardcore Christian on homeschooler too, and some of them are also unschooling, I think that's a point that needs to be reiterated. I think people forget that. They tend not to register, partly because they 
would have difficulty meeting curriculum requirements here. We have to teach stuff around um, evolution. We have to talk about, you can't really talk about intelligent design or young earth creationism, for example. Um, but those families as well would be quite antithetical to institutionalization. So to register would be an affront to their beliefs about institutional power and the sort of encroachment of institutions in the family life. So those sort of people would be off the spectrum, but we would have the same as the US. So I have met unschoolers. I would think the majority of the people here do a more eclectic approach. So you might do a little bit of maths and a little bit of English, just so that you can report to the government. But then other, the rest of the day, the child is free. And a friend of mine from the University of Western Sydney talks frequently about the sort of benign neglect of the home education family, where you do your bit of work in the morning and then run along, find something to do in the yard, come back when you're hungry and you need me to cut you a sandwich, that kind of thing. I have a friend who called her, her homeschooling school the school of benign neglect. And it was like, I, I love it. it. You feel I it. love it. Um, so in terms of social acceptableness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Australia, is it a socially accepted option? Do you get a hard time from people if you homeschool? Do kids, like, do people always ask your kids, what grade are you in? What school do you go to? Um, schooling's a really interesting thing in Australia. In Victoria, which is sort of two and a bit sort of states below where I live, if you look at the map of Australia, where you went to school is the most important thing about who you are. So the first thing anyone in Victoria asks you is, oh, where did you go to school? And then you're supposed to respond with a particular school and then they know who you are based on the school you went to. So I would imagine it's different in different states. But socially, acceptability-wise, I think that home education is becoming increasingly visible. So that, I think, changes how its social acceptance works in terms of, so if you go to the shops, the, the, uh, we do home educate and I have three kids and we go to the the local market called Zone Fresh and the ladies at Zone Fresh all know that my kids are home educated and then they'll say oh, where are your kids today and I'll be like oh they're home with dad he's a parent too he doesn't babysit so I'm just you know getting a few things after I've been out at the gym or whatever so that's part of it too or I'll have two of the three kids and I want to know where the third one is and no one has ever given me a hard time with the exception, say, of um, my parents were very worried about it. My mother, and I'm quoting now, said, gee, that's an awfully dangerous experiment you're running with your children's future there. So I think a lot of attitudes prevail. But I also feel like it's kind of a bit, we're a bit laid back in a way, like you do you is kind of the catch cry, should be right, mate, is sort of what we say. And yeah, I, I feel like it's becoming increasingly socially acceptable and very much more visible. I love that. It's so funny because we have similar backgrounds and my parents sound very similar to your parents. And my parents did call it Gina's great big educational experiment. Oh. Are you, yeah, right. And are you sure you want to do it? Right. And so thank goodness my son is now 24. I know it worked, but it was at that time a great big educational experiment. So I think that's interesting that your parents said that. I think that if my parents ever come to the U.S., they shouldn't touch your parents or they might... No, I, I think they should totally meet. I think that they would get along so well. I think they should totally meet. Um, so states do the rules and regulations. Yes. And then in terms of accountability. So here in New York, we have our quarterly reports and our end of the year assessments. What is it like in Australia? So again, it depends on your state or territory. So I'll start south with Victoria. And in Victoria, which is the second biggest state by population, but one of the smaller ones, you, can, you register with a school, not so much the department. So you could be part-time homeschooled in Victoria, which is great for a lot of Victorian families. Because let's be honest, one of school's principal functions is to look after children while parents work. So it does provide a really nice, and I know that Giddens is really contested, but it is a third way between home ed and schooling. So a lot of families in Victoria do part-time schooling. In New South Wales, which is the biggest by population, it's where Sydney is, which is what everyone thinks it was when they think of Australia, the Harbour Bridge and the you know Harbour and all the rest, and the Opera House. Um, in that state where the Opera House is, you have to have, um, an interview with what's called an authorized person. And this authorized person works for the department. 
Now there is like all education, some quite strong social class stuff in this. And when you talk to the Home Education Association, anecdotally, they will say you are much more likely to get a longer registration period. So they can do up to, I think it's three years. You were more likely to get to the three year mark if your house has paintings on the wall, if you have books, if the parents have a degree, the house is super tidy, all these kinds of markers of middle-class cultural capital. And that they'll only register you for a month or three months if you don't have some of those. So that I think is problematic. In Queensland, where I live, you register with the Department of Education called the Home Education Unit. Now the Home Education Unit's original sort of statement of responsibility was to send every child back to school. So you get the idea of how um, on board with home ed they are. You register with it by filling out a form and putting in a basic plan of what you're going to do for 12 months and then at the 10 month mark if you're accepted you have to report back with a physical printed out report and you send it back in you have to report on maths you have to report on english so numeracy and literacy and one other subject now you can write a report about any subject you like but if you aren't writing the report it doesn't count so if my kid does little athletics which one of my children would love to do i can't ask their coach to write the report on phys ed for me because it doesn't count i would have to write it and usually i show music because my kids do music but i can't use that as my reporting because i didn't actually teach them the music so this is a problem here in Queensland. There are very few people, and now I'm thinking about the country in the Northern Territory. West Australia has a reasonable population, but it's another country. I, it's nine hours to get there basically, so forget it, six hours, sorry. And then in South Australia, you can do the part-time thing as well, and Tasmania is quite small. The ACT has just gone through a huge upheaval in terms of how they do home ed, and it seems to be a little better there. So I think ACT, Victoria, Probably South Australia and Tasmania have really good arrangements, but Queensland and New South Wales, certainly not. And I think WA is problematic too. So there's been huge, huge debate regarding regulation and mm -hmm. home education in the United States. We have the Harvard professor um, who has done, you know, a, a real interesting article on regulation. Um, in terms of regulation, in your opinion, is it is it just right? Is it too harsh? Is it should we be giving home educated families more freedom? I think the regulation differs by state. So there really seems to be no sort of theoretical approach to this. There's nothing really, it, there's no like ontological or epistemological lens that can be applied to home education in Australia. Queensland is very regulatory and is very quick to deregister families if they think you're not doing the right thing. I think there's a very strong correlation between how easy it is to register and how easy it is to stay registered and how supported you feel and your decision to register. So my first degree is advertising. And one of the ways that you make people do what you want them to do is to have a call to action that's really easy to follow. And I feel like the government does have some oversight over the community. That's what we pay taxes for. That's part of their job. But they need to make it swings and roundabouts. And while, yes, they do have oversight, they need to make it easy for families to go along with that oversight. So if you're having trouble with your report, then the department should be there to say, oh, okay, let me have a look at what you've got going on and let me help you in the same way that as a teacher, if I was having trouble with reporting to my students, there's an entire chain of people that I can approach. If it's senior secondary, I go to this mob. If it's secondary, I go to this mob. If it's primary, I go to this mob. All of these different options and the same should be true for parents. And then if they truly did want to know what was happening to children, they truly were concerned about sexual abuse or um, you know, general abuse and lack of education in home educated families, which is what they profess, then they would make it easy for home educated families to engage with authorities. And they really don't do that here. I think, I think we see similar issues. I think that's so interesting. So one of the ways we met is through research. So I want you to talk about some of your research on home education and some of your most interesting findings. I don't know if they're interesting for everybody. Um, so my first degree is <laughs> my first degree is advertising. So I'm always interested in consumer behavior. And what attracted me to home ed research in the first place was this idea that not only are you not choosing a school, you're choosing to not choose. 
And we all know that being non-political is a political decision. So choosing to not choose an education is also a very strong educational stance that you're taking. So I was very interested in how families came to make this choice. And at the moment, I'm working on a chapter where I'm looking at the two groups of choosers in Australia. So I, I believe, and looking at research around, particularly students with um, special education needs, so children identify as ASD, autism spectrum disorder, who may identify as having ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, any of those kinds of things. The research there finds that children who spend a period of time at school and then come home are hugely benefited from that move back home. So I think if you look at the Australian situation where there's quite a strong regulatory framework, there are two groups of people who choose to home educate. There is the probably, I'm going to say 20%, but I think that's probably really high and numbers are very difficult to ascertain as they are in the US. Um, say people who are deliberate home educators, they're making an a priori decision to home educate. They were never going to send their children to school. It's not a truly a priori decision because they've probably been schooled or they've seen television. They know what school looks like. It's fine. They, they have some knowledge of school, but they were against that institutionalization. Maybe there's that, is it Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7, that they believe, you know, in keeping their children home for God's purposes. Maybe it's, you know, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's and the child is God's. So they're not going to give the children to Caesar through schooling. Maybe they're severely anti-vaccination and refuse to go along with the no vax, no play policies, um, any of those kind of reasons. They were never going to send their kids to school. The vast majority of Australian families who choose to home educate are not doing it for the ideological or even really the pedagogical reasons that we read about in Van Galen. They're making it up pros pros how do you say that word, <laughs> that posterior decision, the, um, the other one. It comes from an epistemological experience of schooling and knowing that having tried one, three, five schools, it just doesn't work for their child. So the bulk of our families are choosing it because of experiences with schooling that haven't worked. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, right? And when we talk about um, socialization and homeschoolers, one of the reasons why people tend to choose homeschooling is because of the so socialization experiences that individuals have had in school that didn't work for them. So I always think it's such an interesting like conversation, right? Oh, socialization drives me insane. I never want to answer another media question about socialization. I won't force you to. <laughs> I met a child a couple of years ago who had was gender non-binary. So he called himself he, but he really liked rainbows and unicorns and mermaids. And he wanted to wear the dress. So in Australia, you have two choices. You have the pants or the dress. And theoretically, anybody can wear what they like. But the social code is very strongly gendered in terms of boys wear the pants and girls wear the dresses. And of course, that has implications for how you can climb trees and how you play and how you sit and all sorts of things as they get older. Um, and what happens to you in classrooms? Having been a secondary school teacher, the dress is an incredibly um, unsafe outfit really to wear, but you don't wear pants because you just wouldn't. Um, so this kid wanted to wear the dress and someone pushed him over in the disabled toilet and weed on him because of his gendered identification. And the principal had, the mother's story was, sat in front of her in this office and he was an incredibly bellicose kind of a man, pushed the forms for home education to her and said, mother, that's what you should do for this particular child. So parents, I think there's so many reasons why parents choose it, but that was an example. Another one I met also, I think it was last year, the child had severe anaphylactic reaction to, I can't remember, lactose, I think it was. And so was wearing, they're five, they're in prep, they're wearing two pairs of gloves just to walk up the stairs to get into school so that they would take that set of gloves off and then put another one on so they didn't touch their face so they didn't have an anaphylactic reaction. They were carrying three EpiPens, they're five, and the school eventually said, look, we cannot keep your child safe. You need to send them home. So these are parents who really want to send their kids to school, who have tried to send their kids to school, who've done all the things that you're supposed to do. You send your kid to school, you go and get a job, you do your best that way. And it just hasn't worked out. And I think they're sort of quite emblematic, or symptomatic, I suppose, of problems in Australian education that lead to the accidental home education families. So interesting. So a lot of your research or the research that I've read centers on parents 
and um, attachment parenting and mothering, right? I heard um, the term like uh, scholar mother for the first time today and it put together and I think that's so interesting, right? So yes. talk to me about that attachment parenting research and that attachment research and how it relates to home education. I think the really interesting thing about all education choices is that you can never separate them from the family milieu in which you take those choices. So your parents, Gina and mine, who sent us to really good schools because they were aspirational, comes from their belief about what good parenting looks like. So for my parents, it was pushing you as hard as you could. They would lock me, not even kidding, in my room on Sundays between nine and three. I was allowed a half an hour break to get lunch. And if I needed the toilet, I had to knock on the door and tell my mom because she thought that studying for six hours on a Sunday was what good parenting looked like. And God bless her, she was true to her beliefs. And I think you can't separate that from the kind of school she chose, the activities that we were allowed to do, all of those things. It doesn't matter whether you choose homeschooling or the most elite, expensive private school, they're all connected. So with home education, your beliefs about the child's role in the family, the family's role in society, what it means to be a good mother, to mother for schooling, to use the words of Griffiths and Smith, is it's inseparable from your choice to home educate. And while Annette LaRue, she wrote that book, Home Advantage, which is fantastic. She looked at social class and how mothers use that sort of social class, you know, the currency that they have, the cultural capital and the social capital to ensure success for their children. She talked about that, but no one really looks at that in terms of home education. And I think that's a really interesting space. So the piece I'm writing at the moment about the accidental and the deliberate, I'm using the theoretical lens of responsabilization to describe it. So responsabilization says that in late capitalist societies, it's incredibly risky. And that the position that you're in on the social rung, there's no guarantees that your kid will be there too. So you have to take all of these opportunities and make them for yourself in a way that the state used to. So in Australia, I was born in the late 1970s. You, you could send your kid to the local state school, they'd have been fine. And today, you could send your kid to the local state school, they'd probably be fine. But what parents do is they get tutoring and they get private schools. Yeah, I see you mouthing your tutoring. And they get private schools and they do piano and violin in order to build this resume, which we don't have for university entrance here. You get a score and that's how you get in. So you have this resume now of things that your child has done and you're increasingly responsibilized because the success and failure or failure of your child comes back to you as a parent. So understanding why parents increasingly choose home education, if you look at it through a lens of responsabilization, actually that's the most sensible thing you can do. If you take a really rational action market-based approach, home educating is like the pinnacle of the decisions, really more so than a private school, more so than a state school, because you take all the responsibility on yourself. So you ensure that they get every chance at success. So interesting. And it kind of goes back to, so it really was my big educational experience. <laughs> they weren't wrong there. <laughs> that's very interesting. I know, I know. That's very interesting though. I think it's that part of your work, I think, makes so much sense and is so interesting and is so, like, has so many ways you can go with it. I think it's so cool. Um, all right. So I love theory. I'm a theory nerd. I'm okay oh, with that. So good, though. So good. So we are June 2020, and we are either in COVID or post COVID, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. How has the how has homeschooling in Australia changed because of it um mm -hmm. how have things altered and shifted I think COVID has been a really interesting experiment so I think a lot of parents for the first time really saw what their children were doing at school I think for a lot of them it was a shock that the rubbish the kid was being given for homework wasn't just rubbish they were being given for homework so it looked like you had to engage with the school I think the other thing too, which is super interesting, is a lot of that research around parents' roles in school. So we know from research that kids do really well who are middle class, partly because mothers are responsibilized to be involved in that education. So Annette LaRue talks about that home advantage is that the mother is responsible, it gets involved in the kid's education. And for the first time we had the total involvement of the mother in the education. And, and let's be honest, it was, it was mothers, the, research seems to say it fell increasingly to women. So they were really very involved. And I think for a lot of them, they were 
either horrified at how much they had to do. So a colleague after a staff meeting felt the need to, um, bless me father for I have sinned. I have to confess to you that I hated it and I don't know how you would want to write about this or be involved in this. And that's fine. It's not my circus, not my monkeys. So they was either had that experience or they had the experience of my kids dyslexic. And wow, I really watched them grow in that time because they weren't anxious and stressed. A mother who I met a couple of weekends ago said she was thinking of keeping her kid home because, and I'm quoting, I had my kid back rather than at school. She had her kid back again, the kid that she'd known before they went to school. So I think for it went sort of two ways. And again, I think the problem in Australia in most of our states is the lack of a third way. I think we have lots of people who would like to choose part-time schooling because then they could work more easily because, you know, Gina, you've done it. I do it. It's really hard to have a coherent, higher order thinking kind of thought while you're home educating because somebody needs a sandwich or somebody has just used the toilet and needs to now have you wiped or somebody has, I don't know, um, can you tell me again, can I read you sick Nick now because I can't be bothered, didn't want to read it earlier on, even though that's when it was convenient for you to listen to my story. So all of these things would be great just to have two to three days a week. And if schools can make teachers part-time, then why can't they make students part-time? I mean, if you just set the lines up in the timetable, I don't understand why it's so hard, but apparently it is. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it, right, in thinking that like, I've, I've been tasked in many, many committees to reimagine what education looks like post-COVID. Um, and, you know, like, I, I, I don't have the answers just like everyone else. I think part in the United States, I think part of the, the part-time schooling thing that gets hard is the whole employment equity issue, right? Can parents or a parent stay home or get a part-time income and homeschool. So that's where it gets messy, right? It, it has to do with economics and it has to do with equity and who can afford what and things like that. So one of the issues I have with like reimagining, and of course I love the idea of like a part-time, you know, schooling situation. Um, one of the issues I have with reimagining is because of economics and I'm not really a money person. So I think that's so interesting. But I think that comes back to responsabilization too and late capitalism and the risks of living in a late capitalist society. If we all had a UBI, for example, universal basic income, that would solve those problems because you could afford to stay home a couple of days a week or, you know, grandma and grandpa don't need to keep working. So maybe they can help out with the kid. But I think there, that is an issue. But I think partly too, there's a social class difference between Australia and the USA. And while there are significant numbers of parents who are quite low socioeconomic here in Australia who do it, some single mums, for example, the vast majority of parents are the traditional middle-class family where dad goes to work and mum stays home. There's two or three kids that you're homeschooling. Or this family I met with a dyslexic kid where he was going to stay home because she earned more money. So that was how they were gonna, they were gonna work it. And she was going to work home from home a couple of days a week. He might stay on two days a week and go to work then. And they were going to work that out. But yeah, that's the issue. Yeah. We have to reimagine workplaces too, right? And we have to reimagine structure and income and everything else. The problem is capitalism. The problem isn't home ed. And when people complain about, oh, it's so hard for these reasons, you're not complaining about home education. You're complaining about capitalism. It's so yeah. interesting. Forward uh, to the barricades, Gina. Forward to the barricades. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I think that is actually an Australian thing. Forward to the barricades. Yeah, yeah definitely not. <laughs> definitely not here. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> but fun anyway, and I'm going to use that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, look up, like, I'll look up later and tell you what it means. I, I love it. <laughs> so we talk a little bit about post-COVID, but what about homeschooling in the future in Australia, right? So what might that look like? What might change? What might stay the same? I think there'll be more people who do it. I think you look at the trend, it is pretty obvious it's going in one direction, which is up. More and more families are going to choose it. I think post-COVID, there's going to be a bigger growth, but then it'll continue to track after that. I think as workplaces become more flexible, it kind of does become easier just to keep the kids home because, you know, when the education department sent out information during COVID, their thing in Queensland was it was going to take you about an hour maximum of two to get all the work done in the day. And then they had a big disclaimer, probably won't even take that long. So I think part of the questioning in COVID by parents was, well, I give them to you for six hours. What are they doing for six hours? Like that's a long time for them just to be getting 45 minutes to 
you know, 90 minutes, maybe 120 at a stretch done. Like that's a lot. There's a huge difference. There's four hours there that are unaccounted for at best. So I think that may change. I think we'll see the numbers increase. There may well be more demands on state governments to look at alternatives, maybe a sort of midway thing, but we're quite, quite traditional here in Australia. And we like to think of ourselves as a bit, bit ochre, a bit like we like to identify with our bush rangers, but really people toe the line. So people are less inclined, I think, to kind of push too hard. I mean, the Queensland Teachers Union, for example, has never gone on strike in the entire however many years of our existence. So we, we're not really those kinds of, in Queensland in particular, but look, you know, the Home Education Association, which is the peak body for home educators in Australia, they're fighting really hard against some of the legislative issues, particularly here in Queensland. And I hope that in the next 12 months to 18 months, they'll have some wins there. So awesome. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, it's, I mean, some of it is so different, right, than from what I, like we experience here in the U.S. And some of it is so much the same. Um, I think there are real cultural differences, too. And I think, you know, Americans, I think, like to think of Australians as kind of like your little brother or your little cousin, but I actually think we're quite different. We're kind of a, a third way between America and the, and the UK. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So what about future directions in your work? You have so many exciting projects going on. So talk to me about I do. future. Yeah. So I'm on, on a couple of really interesting grants. I'm on a grant at the moment, which wraps up next year, looking at private tutoring and how parents access private tutoring. So we tried to access the home education community for that, but then COVID happened. So we had to shut down our work. So that's a really interesting project. I'm on an autism CRC grant looking at autism in the middle years, which is a very unstudied area. But interestingly, that seems to be when children come home after a period of school, because about the age of, in about grade four, the socialization starts to change in schools and it becomes really obvious that they can't perform socialization as well, unless they're incredibly adept. So usually females. Um, so that's a project that I'm looking, I'm working on. I'm writing a book with some colleagues looking at millennial women's experiences of being mothers um, and working and trying to have it all. It's called the myth of superwoman at the moment. So that's very fun. Even though one of my authors is a stress head, um, she's freaking out constantly about everything. Um, but she's first author. So I guess that's, that's her job. And um, I'm also editing a book about global perspectives on home education at the moment. And you have an exciting chapter in that. Would you like to tell us about your chapter, Gina? What are you writing about? So excited. Um, so I am weeks late on that chapter. And I, Aren't we all? <laughs> and I am writing about outcomes. So what happens to homeschoolers when they grow up? And, you know, you would think I know a lot about that. Um, I do have a grown homeschooler in my house, um, but I've also been learning a lot through writing that chapter. I tend to focus on research on more unschooly things and more uh, less formal homeschooling. So it's been nice to go back to that sort of traditional homeschooling realm that I started in and really look at what happens to homeschoolers when they grow up. And have you collected fresh data for that chapter or are you using other um, people's data? Other people's data. I love other people's daughter. It's my favorite thing. I don't have to fight the ethics section. Yeah. Just to tell you once, I once applied for ethics to do a research project looking at single mothers who home educate. Now I'm not a single mother and this, I won't say what he is because it's not fit to print, but he rejected my ethics outright because, and I'm quoting, you're a bit too connected to the community. And I was horrified. And I went back and I talked to some colleagues who also do home ed research in Australia. And um, Glenda Jackson, who's a very famous Australian home education researcher said, Oh, what an idiot. What? Like his kids go to school. Is he allowed to research schooling? And I'm like, yeah, right on sister. Like what an idiot. Oh, <laughs> that's so oh. silly. Oh yes. It was really. And so I now try and do research where I just use other people's data. And so, um, where, well, first of all, did I miss anything? Right. I, so did I miss sorry. anything regarding your work or did I miss anything regarding what people should know about homeschooling in Australia? I don't think so. I think it's, it's on trend. There we go. I love it. It is on trend, right? Finally. I know. Maybe it's <laughs> only taken years. How many years? I know. Like a lot of years. <laughs> so old. Everything old is new again, right? Like uh, back in the day, uh, 200 years ago. We're all with our centuries of childhood. <laughs> and then where can people find you after this? Because they're going to want to find you. Oh, you. I'm sure they're not. They're going to be like, who is that crazy Australian lady? I'm totally going to want to find you. the right number of syllables. We don't even call that kind. Like, it's, it's Australia. We call ourselves Australian. It's Australian. like a lot of 
Shrian. Shrian. <laughs> yeah, I say it with a southern accent, so it doesn't work at all. Ah, get, actually, there's a way of speaking in Australia called Strain, S T R A Y N, which is the Australian you accent. Oh, yeah, I yeah. love that. Um, so you can ask me in Strain at my, just get in touch with me at QUT. I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. This is so fun. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a reference, Jaina. It's been a reference, and that's the way it's to do it. So fun. Uh, we had so much fun, people. All right. <laughs> That's right. This has not been like any other conference I've ever been to. Right? We have fun in this conference. Yeah. That's right. We should be interviewing everyone, people. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Can you imagine? <laughs> All right. So I think we have to do like a three-minute teaser. Oh, God help me. Um, I have no idea how to do that. I wish I could sing or something. <laughs> and I would like or rap. So, or I mean, I think you can introduce yourself. You can talk about what we talked about. It. Pro I know mine wasn't three minutes. Mine was probably, and Liz will tell me, it was probably 30 seconds or so. Okay. Um, but I think it What's was like, so I can be quick. no, I know you could, but take longer for yours. Um, I, don't know. I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know. So I would just introduce yourself and tell people what we talked about. What do I yeah, mean? I, mean, I can make an advertisement for how this conference is so like global west. Come and talk to us because we're talking about the global east. Yeah, yeah. The people, those sort of the land. I should. What's the words of that song? The land down under. Women. What is it? I forget. The land down under. Down under. Yeah. Well, we can. Look, can we can look up the lyrics and then we can sing. Huh. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, you're thinking of your three it. minutes. I know. Maybe we can just play that. Hey, maybe we can play. Kookaburra sits in the old gum tree. Merry, merry, <laughs> we can have music and everything. Laugh, kookaburra, laugh, kookaburra, gay, your life must be. You've never heard that song, have you? Is that, can I get you to that one? Because that's a great one. <laughs> Go for it. If, if, do a bit of Bound for Botany Bay. Oh, no, I actually don't even know the words of that anymore. My kid, if she, my kid was here, she could play that on violin. But um, I love it. Yeah, no. Um, I know. Okay, I'll just try. My, this is so awkward. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Rebecca English. I am from the Queensland University of Technology in Australia. And I am talking with Gina Riley about the differences really between home education in Australia and in the USA and talking a little bit about the Australian context, which seems to be missed quite a lot in many discussions of global home education. So, so good. That'll do. So, so good. <laughs> Can you do that once more and maybe I'll take off my screen. Hold on. I'll put you on speaker view just in case. I'll stop my video. Just oh, I don't even know what I said. It was so good. Whatever you did was so good. Okay. All right. Good. All right. <laughs> I love your picture. That's so cool. <laughs> you had such long hair. I did have such long hair then and then I chopped it off real short. I do it every like, like five years. I'll chop it off real short and then grow it back again. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Rebecca English. I'm from the Queensland University of Technology in Queensland, Australia. Come listen to my presentation where I have a great chat, good old yarn, with Gina Riley, and we talk about the differences between home education in Australia and in the USA. Australia is a great place, and it's someone that often gets missed in global conversations about home ed. So come on down and have a listen. So good. We're good. It's a wrap. <laughs> Where the bloody hell are you? Um, yeah. So good. Thank you. Now you can go to bed. You poor thing, you must be tired. Have you got to work again tomorrow morning? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I work a lot, so I don't really even, like, get up, check the chickens, go to work. <laughs> really? What do you do for fun, then? This. Okay. <laughs> No, you know what I do? I do. I, I like go up steep, I hike, I walk. I do I'm stuff super. like that. Yeah, I do stuff like that. I like visit farms. Oh, that's awesome. Plant flowers and vegetables. That's what I do for fun. That's awesome. That is so good. Yeah. Yeah. So well, this morning, do you have class? You do, maybe? No, no, no. no. I have, uh, it's semester break now. 
and I am like a bit mainly retentive. So I have already prepped for next semester and I now need to email the person who's in charge of the unit and go, please don't delete anything because English and business studies are set. They are done. I don't want to change. I had to change everything because it's all online this semester. Course, yeah. The stuff I had from last semester and I inherited English with someone else and they, I, I don't know, you know what your blackboards are like, but I like them to be like, we're going to do this and then this and then this, and that is literally it. Mm -hmm. But they had so much stuff. English like seems to feel the need to, let's talk about what it means to be an English teacher every single week. And we're going to read a Gothic novel through the whole term while we're also doing curriculum studies and we're doing assessment and we're doing pedagogy. And I think, I think you've ever done it. Or yeah. done, don't yeah. ever perform. No. I agree. Particularly not I, online, not online. You can't overperform online. Mm -hmm. So some of mine are going to go away and watch um, the Demon Headmaster. I don't know. You probably you, do you teach English? No, you don't. Okay, the Demon Headmaster, speculative fiction. It's an English book series, and they did videos about it. It's really good. But I like spec fic. It's my favorite genre. Yeah. So they're watching that a bit, and then they're going to talk a little bit about this amazing Australian book, which is young adult spec fic called. Um, Strange Objects by a guy called Gary Crew. Super great story. So but yeah. cool. So <laughs> no, it's not, I'm nerding so out. Cool. Texted the other day, she's like, give me some books that I could read. And I'm like, you ever read Hemingway? And she was like, who? <laughs> and I was like, oh, mate, you might <laughs> yeah. get yourself, go get yourself in a fiesta the sun also rises. That'll uh, love. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I love it. I, 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 I like my fan, my, my really casual fiction. Casual Very fiction. Casual fiction. Talk me about that text type, Jane. What's casual fiction? Like, I don't like, oh no, like really like, um, like I read, well, no, I read not, no, well, sometimes casual fiction. So like really good stories. So mm -hmm. like, um, what's the last one I read? Well, Glennon Melton's Untamed, but that was way nonfiction and I love that. Um, but really good, I like Anne Lamott. Like I do like nonfiction, but sometimes a really good story gets me. So I, I like really casual fiction. I'm like, awesome. I'm like a 13 year old too. I like preteen stuff, but I'm an adolescent oh, special. Okay. I swear to God, got to read this strange objects. It's a super interesting book. Cause it's all like <sighs> cobbled together. This guy's like, um, it's set in the eighties in West Australia. And the way they talk about indigenous folk gives you a really interesting idea about race. Oh, in the 80s. It's such a good story. And it's really quite hauntingly told. And I, like, it was really important to me as a kid, but I loved it. And I think it's a really clever story. And it was Gary Crew is the author. And he's a really famous Australian young adult fiction author. And he writes really great stories and it's very cleverly told. Oh, so cool. Right. Okay. I'm going to look it up. Strange objects about a ring, about a, this like ring a on ring. this cake. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna look it up. I'm so excited. Yeah, because you can buy it on Kindle. I bought it recently and I was reading it again and again. Like, I get oh trapped. Oh my gosh, so now I'm gonna look. Now I'm gonna, oh my gosh, okay. Strange objects, hold on, hold on. By Gary Crew. Okay. We could probably start recording this because now we're just having a conversation. Oh, shoot. Goodbye. I'm gonna cut this tomorrow. Thank you.